Nihao and I will try and moderate to the best of our abilities, given the, uh, the power of your three voices, but um, just bear that in mind. Uh, we have 30 people on uh, recorded now and people are, are joining in now as we go. This for your speakers will be recorded. It'll be available on YouTube as a recording afterwards and also linked via our website. And we will be um, tweeting any highlights that come out of it. So Samir, this is a, a great opportunity for you to get us to tweet your words. <laughs> I'll be looking for any words you want to say about the current economic situation. Um, and that's it. But of course, this is conversational. So exactly as we've been speaking in the last 10 minutes in the preparation period, keep speaking this way. Just watch the jumping in when someone else is speaking because the audio doesn't work. Um, Rathin, you're a little bit distanced in your, in your voice. I don't know whether you've got a, a um, mic, uh, sorry, headphones you could use that might improve the quality of the audio slightly. Okay, Salafi, we'll, we'll go with it. How, how good or bad is this? It's not, not bad, it's just a bit fuzzy. It's a bit like you're listening to an, an old fashioned black and white television set. That's, that's the quality of my internet. There's not, not much I can do about it. Delavi. Okay, no, it's, good, it's good enough, it's fine. Um, pictures are great, so it's looking wonderful. We're up to 43 people. We'll just give it a couple of more minutes and then Neha will, will kick us off on this. Um, and uh, Samir, for your interest in my screen, behind me, well, I've got one of these blue screens, is the note to our conference on in two weeks. Adair Turner speaking at it. You'll be interested to note, uh, along with um, Rathin Roy uh, on, on issues to do with mitigation and climate. Uh, I, I will send you all a link afterwards in case you're interested in any of your team members joining the conference. Um, it's, it's all online. It's much diminished in terms of our, what our usual conferences are like. Uh, but next year, we are planning a, more, a hybrid in-person online conference in March. And we would like to come back to you to make sure that we have a substantial India-focused presence in that conference. And we'll invite you to come and speak to, to that in a session focused on what we hope at that point will be an optimistic view of Indian recovery. But let's see what we get to by next March. Um, yeah, I, OK, Rasin, I've, I've got to be optimistic. Right? <laughs> And, uh, and that's the story. So um, I hope you know that if you look at your screen, there are two uh, buttons that are important. There's a chat button that will allow you to communicate. That's primarily for communication off picture with your other speakers. You don't have to use this, I'm just alerting you. So if you want to, if Rathi and you want to send a note to Nina, why don't you ask this question? You can use this chat button. Um, but most people will be asking to use what's called the Q&A button, which is showing up on the screen. They can ask questions at any stage. We will not promise to answer them, but Niha and I will be scanning them and picking out ones that we think are useful. You know, for example, we have a couple of old friends like Nick Robbins who wants to ask a question, in which case he will type it in there and we'll weave it into the conversation. We're not planning to have a separate Q&A session at the end. So we'll pick out the questions that we think are of interest. You can, of course, look at that at any time as well. And in fact, you can even answer a question. If someone says, Nina, what about this? Nina, you're happy, just, you can just add that in text if you so wish. It doesn't need to be part of it all. So we have two layers here. Um, so I think that's everything about the technical aspect while we're just waiting for another 20 odd people to, to register. Any questions, Samir, Rathin or Nina? No, not from me, thank you. Okay. Um, people are still coming. It's, it's amazing how long it takes people to actually sign up, but um, invariably it takes five minutes before we have the full audience involved. We've got an hour and a quarter for this session. Uh, Niha will keep us to time on that. And, um, and let's see how we go. So Niha, I think um, over to you now to more formally Kick us off. You're on mute. So I think we'll just wait a minute or so more. Um, a couple of hundred people, about 200 people have registered. So let's get to the half mark to start with.
like waiting for Godot. Yeah. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I rarely get more than 35%, huh? especially in the afternoon, because people find there are other things to do. Evening is better. 35% uh, of what? People turn it Ratin has a statistic for everything. <laughs> so I, I now what? Registration. What's that slow mask slides. for? Yeah. Ratin. I just tell you. Tiga. Oh. Huh? Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Your voice was better. Your voice is better, than Ratin. <laughs> that, That's the mask. <laughs> With the mask sounding better. <laughs> looking looking better too, Ratan. I just realized I didn't have a um, connection to, I didn't have the keyboard in front of me. So somebody came oh. in and then we marked. You know, it's actually not a bad idea. And I know now we are live, but it's not a bad idea to have like all folks wearing masks and speaking their mind without their names being announced. <laughs> like, like say it's from a pool of experts, mask them up and let them speak freely. <laughs> I think it might be might actually. I think the policy change in today's world. We'll have to change our voice. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the bull of COVID, huh? Everybody mm -hmm. masked up and speaking their mind. Yeah. I mean, who would have, but thought, that, who would have thought that banks would tell you to come wearing masks to take money from them? Can you imagine? Like, <laughs> this is the world we live in. <laughs> but we will, we will try to do that without masks on this webinar because. Uh, okay, now Ritin is going somewhere, let him come back. I think we will just start in 30 seconds now. As soon as Ratin's back, let's start, because I think we're going yeah. a bit long now. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. So we are starting now. Uh, I would like to welcome all of you who have joined in and are joining in to this webinar. Uh, where we will discuss the COVID aftermath. Everybody's discussing this, uh, and here is a chance for us to discuss uh, its repercussions and the options that India has in front of it. The title of course is called, Can Sustainable Finance Help India Shape a Green and Inclusive Recovery? So as we know, um, um, all the countries, they are facing um, a shock in, uh, economic uh, demand and supply. Uh, for emerging economies, it is even worse. For India, the challenges are even multifold because we were already in um, uh, multiple quarters facing an economic slowdown. And come COVID, we are actually hit pretty hard. And not only that, there were many, many uh, fault lines which had already started sort of surfacing and which relate to you know, uh, joblessness, depleting jobs, environmental degradation, uh, climate hazards, and um, um, whatever have you. So uh, in this context, we have uh, a very, very good panel to actually look at the big picture questions, uh, big picture questions in terms of policy choices that we have, in terms of the market choices that we have in order to move forward. And we have a stellar panel uh, with us. I will uh, quickly introduce uh, the panelists. Um, um, all three of them may be known to a whole lot of you, but there is a substantial international audience. So let me introduce, and I will begin with Ms. Nenaral Kidway. Um, great ally, great friend, uh, very, very honored to have you here. And I begin with you because uh, we actually, it is a great honor for anybody tracking Indian financial sector, one knows that Nena has been and is continues to be its heroes and uh, one of its very, very prominent champions. Um, she has been passionately involved with the issues of environment, water, and sanitation. She is currently on the boards of many companies. Um, she's the chairman of Advent India Advisory Board, non-executive director on the board of um, Max, uh, yeah. Max Financial Services. Got to yeah. <laughs> yeah, all of that. Um, but she retired as the HSBC chairperson in India and uh, has uh, written a um, couple of books and our, our topic close to her heart is uh, sanitation. And in the course of our conversations, uh, in the course of our conversation, of course, we'll touch many aspects. Um, 
just to tell people that she also uh, is the former boss of Ratin Roy, who is our next panelist. Uh, I think, I think. <laughs> the boss to Ratin Roy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you gave, I think you gave him his first job. Uh, he's been doing pretty well after that. Ratin uh, is uh, one of the foremost voices on uh, macroeconomics, uh, India's leading macroeconomic thinker. And might I add that I think, um, the only macroeconomist, at least in India, uh, who has been keenly engaging with the issue of sustainable finance, not simply as an adjunct issue, but as, as, as something that uh, he thinks that India can uh, use to meet its capital, massive capital investment needs. Currently, uh, he is um, the uh, director of National Institute of Public Finance and Policy, but these are his uh, just the last week in office at NIPFP, and he'll be joining as MD ODI. Uh, so welcome, Ratan, uh, to uh, to the panel. He was also formerly a member of the Prime, uh, Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. Then I come to our friend Samir, um, a friend and a partner, and uh, definitely someone who doesn't mince his words, uh, mask on or off and uh, give, leaves you with ideas that actually push the boundaries of your thinking process and action uh, thereof. Uh, he is the head of the one of the apex think tanks in India, Observer Research Foundation, a prolific writer, a public policy expert, and his interests span climate change, geopolitics, and internet governance. So I welcome you all and I will give it to Sean, who will set us off, and this is a conversation, we will have a couple of questions. You can ask also sometime that you think a question that comes to your mind, but is relevant for the other speaker. So over to you, Sean. Thanks, Neha. I'm Sean Kidney, the CEO of the Climate Bonds Initiative. Um, on my screen above here is a little note to our conference coming up in three weeks time. Should you be interested, go to our website, climatebonds.net. It's all about how we transition, transition to a better worlds from mitigation and climate to also resilience and sustainability in general. But today, leading ideas, I just want to start off with a couple of international perspectives. We, we've had over the last few years, the growth of uh, appreciation amongst the large international investors about the role of environmental risk in their sustainability, their portfolios. And that's led to a significant increase in environment related bonds, green bonds, including in India. We've seen significant issuance over the time with renewable energy companies, the State Bank of India, and so on issuing. The companies that have gone overseas, been able to issue in hard currencies, have uh, all taken uh, rupee bonds to the London market, masala bonds, so to speak, have been able to get palpable material benefits for their issuance programs as a result of the strength of that investor demand. That's been a background story, and that was the fastest growing asset class on the planet until the crisis hit. Right now, we're in the middle of a, of a major crisis. Uh, in this crisis, while we deal with the shock of losing loved ones, with the economic um, tragedy that we're experiencing around us, there are a few things coming up as ideas that I think are important to note for the purpose of today's discussion. Uh, clearly, the idea of thematic bonds has taken off. What we've seen in, during the crisis is a lot of issuance of, co globally this is, COVID and pandemic bonds, including by sovereigns like Indonesia and Austria. And these are bonds where governments are saying they're sovereign bonds, and in many cases, corporations, there have been 700 of these globally. They're saying the proceeds will be used to something involved in addressing the pandemic. And these have been extremely popular of investors. So if you like, consider this a daughter of the green bond market. The idea of issuing a piece of debt where you are all promising to also make a contribution to a challenge facing society is proving to be a very popular idea of international investors, if you like, and giving benefits to issuers overall. We've seen the growth of social and sustainability bonds, dramatic growth in the first six months of the year. Um, so that's something that's happening on thematic. We've also seen uh, a lot of governments and international organizations coming out and talking about, in the words of the, uh, the managing director of the Inter International Monetary Fund, building back better, that we need to use this hiatus, this crisis, 
to ensure that in our recovery, because we're going to need and we are needing a lot of recovery effort, uh, we invest in things that are future fit and we start to leave behind things that we've had trouble getting rid of in the past. Let's frame it like that. Now, clearly that started off as a green agenda in terms of green infrastructure, clean energy, uh, better public transport, less fewer cars in Mumbai and Delhi with pollution, all these sorts of things. But it's a, um, it's a broader agenda that's growing. So that's one big idea. Uh, and you've seen this in the commitment by the European Commission, where I've been working for the last four years supporting the Commission on its sustainable investment programs to uh, invest heavily in green infrastructure, not in general infrastructure. Um, we've seen in Europe the setting up of a recovery and resilience fund, 750 billion euros, where 30% of all of that fund will be dedicated to green investments. Something you may have missed, though, that the 70% in the rest of that fund, which will be 50% grants to governments and 50% loans to governments, still has to be put through a resilience prism. That is that member states in Europe will need to explain how the funds they're using will build resilience in those economies to future shocks. And I think this is the next big idea. Coming out of this crisis is this appreciation is this is not a one-off crisis. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has been telling us for many years, 25 years, that the 21st century will be a century of pandemics and climate shocks. They've said, that because of the degradation of environmental systems, we can expect more pathogens that are jumping between species and setting off pandemics. And there's a huge host of research about this in the past year. This, this pandemic's been predicted by numerous experts for the last years. That's all, they've just been saying, when, when, when is the question. Uh, we, had a, we had a taste of it a few years ago with the MERS virus, with uh, pathogens jumping between bats in in Egypt in stressed colonies, and we nearly had a pandemic then. In this particular one, again, it looks like pathogens jumping from bats in, uh, uh, in Northeastern ASEAN and in Yunnan province in China has led to something we have been out of control. This is going to happen again, is a very clear message we're now getting. So when we talk about recovery and resilience, we need to be also thinking about how to ensure our societies are prepared for future shocks not just pandemic shocks. We've been hearing about the, the potential of the monsoon failing one year in five by 2050. That would be a major shock to India. We're talking about the potential for intense cyclones in Mumbai leading to extreme floods, even more extreme than we've seen recently in Mumbai. These are examples of shocks that will become norms in what is a 21st century of volatile weather systems, even if we meet the IPCC's targets of getting emissions down because there's so much change in the system. So the discussion that is now coming through is what does this mean in recovery? Well, it no longer, from a climate perspective, the area we work in, mean just ensuring infrastructure hardening, making sure that coastal rail railways are protected from potential sea level rise, that sort of stuff. It's also got to be ecosystem resilience, but more importantly, social resilience and economic resilience. You know, in the US, we learned in the 1930s that introducing unemployment benefit as an automatic stabilizer in an economy was extremely useful to dampen the depth of the, of the recession and the social impact of that. And in many countries around the world, most countries, there are some form of that richer countries, of course. That becomes a critical measure in a world of volatility. Are there other automatic stabilizers we ought to be considering? Well, clearly, the ability to be able to support the poor and the people who are most affected by job losses in the middle of things like pandemics is an area where we need to be thinking about this. What are the measures that we can design now learning from this year that would cut in more automatically in the future and faster to reduce the pain and suffering of people who are most affected by these is a question we need to ask as we consider how to make our resilient, our economies more resilient and our societies more resilient. And I'm going to go a step further, and I'm going to say the Sustainable Development Goals, the development of our economies in South Asia. We need India, the poorer parts of India, to be wealthier and to have greater access to health services above all to be able to weather future crises. 
This is not just something that's important in Orissa or Tamil Nadu. This is important for the world, because if we want to be able to stop the spread of pandemics, we have to deal with the places where they spread most quickly, which is generally amongst the people who are least able to take action to avoid infection. And that requires us to think much more aggressively about access to health in particular and access to other social measures that will allow people to be able to survive the lockdowns or whatever measures we might decide out of this we need to do. So for me, the SDGs suddenly become incredibly important to prepare our world for a 21st century of volatility. And that's something that we think investors are beginning to understand. And that opens up opportunities for different forms of financing that we might not have included, including sovereign financing. And we will see this year sovereign bonds and state bonds and state owned enterprise bonds being issued to finance recovery using a resilience prism. Thailand is in the market today with a sovereign social green bond, which starts this, this um, road and is getting very strong attention from the investor community. They, now, whether this can be relevant to the Indian circumstance, I don't know. I'll need to ask my colleagues about that. But there's some thoughts and ideas that I think are now circulating globally. Back to you, Neha. Yeah, so I will take that uh, question from you, um, uh, Sean, and I will uh, like to bring Ratan in to start off our discussion. Uh, we have had, uh, like I was talking about, the massive economic contraction that we are facing in India. Uh, so I would like you to sort of unpack for us, you know, what, I, what kind of scenarios do you see panning out? And if you were to look at the, uh, the support measures that uh, the government of India has uh, announced and the concerns that uh, are now becoming more a part of the conversation and Sean has uh, alluded, to, alluded to some of them. Going forward, uh, give us a sense of, uh, you know, your, your estimate of how good and well positioned our support measures are. What kind of macroeconomic scenarios do you see from good to bad uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, panning out? And uh, if we were to not include the considerations that Sean has alluded to, uh, how likely are we to land at a rather bad situation instead of actually grabbing the chance to land at a better situation for the economy and the people? Thank you, Neha. Uh, that's a huge question, so I'll only answer parts of it. Uh, the where we are going to go, I think I, I, this bears repeating, because none of us, none of us in India, below the age of seventy-four, has seen a contraction in the economy. We have seen growth slowdowns, but if you take my estimates, which I will take, and they're quite close to the State Bank of India and you see a decline in nominal growth of 13%, that would basically mean that you're wiping out one thirteenth of your existing income. Take 10%, you're wiping out 10% of your existing income. What does that even mean for people in the economy at a human level? There are three things it means immediately which we have to worry about. The first thing that it means is that a country that is already facing mass unemployment and underemployment is going to see people who were or thought they were employed for the foreseeable future losing their jobs and therefore a massive increase in economic security, insecurity. And this process is particularly accentuated in India because of our large proportion of our GDP that is dependent on services and the fact that almost definitionally, the pandemic affects services badly. The second impact is going to be that if you look at government to do something about it, the government is going to be having a much smaller economy to borrow from and to tax. And therefore, uh, and given India's size, the recourse to multilateral resources is limited. Uh, and therefore, the government's ability to look and act ahead is going to have to be 
very different from the parameters that we have seen in the past. And the Prime Minister's message of Atta Nirbhan in this context is very important. And I wish people would understand this. As I read what the Prime Minister is saying, he's not saying that we want all of us to be self-reliant because that's a choice we are making. I think he's saying that because we have no choice. Many of the collective support mechanisms have gone. The third thing that has gone, and I see going before my eyes, and this is partly because, as you said, the Indian economy was already tanking before this disaster hit us, is aspiration. All bold talk in this country on the economy is now focused, I think very unfortunately, on whether we can substitute for China or not. Not about whether we can grow, not about whether we can transform. So China has been very successful in hijacking our economic aspiration through one incursion in the mountains, which has then led to people to argue for the recall of tariffs and to say it is acceptable to go back to a license permit rush and acceptable even to have lower growth as long as we can do without Chinese products. Not to say or ask, as I have been asking, why did we didn't love China particularly? Why were we dependent on them in the first place? If you answered that question, you'd have an aspiration to do well on your own terms. When you do not do that, I'm afraid, and Sabir may speak to this, you have already outsourced your economic policy to the dominant power of this region. Uh, so this is the gloomy place we are in. The macroeconomy is going to shrink to the extent that I do not expect growth to be back to 2019 levels for at least two years, probably three. That is, the size of the economy will not be the size of the economy in 20, uh, that it was in 2019, I think at least until 2022 March, probably 2023. So in that context, we have got to ask, how do we prosper with a smaller economy in the short term? And how can those decisions to prosper as a smaller economy, please, listeners, note what I'm saying, we are going to be a smaller economy. We are going to be a smaller economy. So a lot of the talk that I did and other people did for five years is gone. And we have to worry about how we can prosper as a smaller economy. And then from that prosperity, grow back to our aspirations. And in the process, hopefully, deal with China. To prosper as a smaller economy, I have a solution which fortunately I've been advocating for a while because I was afraid that India was coming to this place I call a middle income trap. We have to change the output composition of demand. I don't want to take up too much time because I want to make one more point on financing and then stop. But consider what has been affected during this pandemic first. Air travel, we're not selling any cars. FMCG has collapsed. Restaurants have collapsed. Hmm? Logistics to feed restaurants, air travel, FMCG has collapsed. If you had had an economy in 20, and Bali is important because services are 50% of my total GDP, 50% plus, and these services and much of our manufacturing is essentially answering to the demand of the top 150 million of the population. But imagine a world in which India 2019 had been a world in which agriculture, affordable textiles, Things not being imported being made in India. An India that was halfway through being slum free and only had to complete that project of being slum free. An India that was able to provide affordable healthcare at a profit to its minimum wage earners. I'm not talking about the poor. And an India that did not have to import education for it to be of quality. If these five things had contributed two thirds of our growth, with exports contributing another 15%, and automobiles and air travel, the rest, we would be a far more resilient economy now. I would be speaking with far more hope to you. So our structure and the imbalance in our structure will need to change and becoming small in areas which have grown too big, I think, affords India with a unique opportunity to effect this structural change. So there are five things I want to see going forward. I want to see agriculture that makes money. I love the Prime Minister's aspiration to double farmers' income. We need to put money behind that, but putting money behind that involves not saying grow more food, but saying what technologies, what processes can solve the problem of the farmer making money, and then you have solved your discord problem. 
you have solved your fertilizer problem. I want India to make 400 rupees shirts. I don't give a damn whether they import it from China or Bangladesh. There is no reason why people who buy 400 rupees shirts in this country should buy them from anywhere outside this country. That would mean fixing certain problems in northern and eastern India, as Sean was saying. I want to see a slum free India by 2024. And I'm appalled that no one is talking about it after the migrant labor crisis. I'm absolutely appalled at our society and our indifference to the fact that the migrant labels are coming back, but not a word is being said about the slum free India. I want to see the healthcare sector develop in a more inclusive way, and then hopefully COVID has shocked us into doing something. And I want to say that if we shrink, and if we are able to come up with this different sort of, by definition, more resilient economy, the finance is there. The finance is there because if you are able to build a more resilient economy, then there is an instrument you can use, which as Sean has been pointing out, people have been using. The technical term for it is consoles. I said it before the European Union, just to be on the record. Within, by, by day three of this crisis, I said we will have to go for consoles. Consoles are what are called protections. The government issues bonds in any currency you like and says that we will pay you a rate of interest. Actually, I would recommend a fairly attractive rate of interest. Keep savings going. But I will, I will announce the calendar of repayment of these consoles in due course. Because the challenge I'm trying to deal with is a long term challenge. And therefore, while I give you, my, while you can earn income out of that challenge, your investment in that challenge is only going to be amortized in the long term. That sort of long term instrument is the only instrument that will enable us to make structural change. You will not get the money from taxation. You will not get the money through sovereign borrowing because every economy is resource constrained and therefore the, the cost of sovereign capital will be very high. And you will then provide the opportunity for people who are also automatically saving. You see, in countries like India, equities markets are going up, and that is because there is a certain cycle by which you make money. Say, I have a salary, I'm not spending as much. I need to put it somewhere. Banks are giving me nothing. I put it in equities. So equity markets boom. In the US, real estate markets are going for the same reason. So the traditional sources of finance are gone. I think fixed income becomes very, very important. And I think thinking of long-term fixed income product in perpetuity becomes very important. One final point. Such a product has to be what is called a programmatic product. It cannot be a sector product. It cannot be an output product. And if you look at the European Union perpetuals, for that is what they are, there is a very detailed programmatic outline on how this product would affect structural change, including inclusion and resilience. And by doing so and changing the output composition of demand, how that would bring returns, which would allow these perpetuals to be paid for. It is in this framework that we will have to think which means essentially for the economists here, the efficient markets hypothesis was dead a long time ago. Now, please bury it. You have to think about assets in the long term, which means definitely thinking more about the income you generate from them and, that, and the prospects for you at a micro level to trade them rather than confusing amortization with sustainability. And if you do that, then all types of sustainability, inclusion, and resilience become business value propositions. So this is how I see the architecture of dealing with the problem changing. And I see an opportunity, unlike everyone else, in only one thing, paradoxically. An economy whose structure had gone horribly wrong is now going to shrink, particularly in the areas that had gone horribly wrong. So here's a chance for us to rebuild better and therefore rebuild bigger. Thank you. Thanks, Ratan. Uh... Sean, you would like to ask him something or shall we move on to, because I would like to. Okay. How can I top that, please? <laughs> okay. Um, now, yeah. Um, thanks, Ratan, a lot. I mean, this is the uh, fundamental shift and probably a very bold attempt to re-engineer your economy and the financing mechanism going forward. And I hope people are listening, but uh, for our discussion also, I would like to bring Nena in over here. Uh, Nena, you have been, you know, with the financial markets and you have been observing uh, very closely. Would just like to understand from you, um, after COVID, what kind of impact, what is the extent of impact that you are uh, seeing on different sources of capital? Because if we understand that, then we'll also be able to understand which sources are better equipped to help us in the recovery. 
and in a stable transition. So that is, you know, that's a question <laughs> that you can help okay. us understand. It. So, so let me just start by uh, thanking Sean for uh, the landscape he set out and uh, Ratin uh, for his ideas and indeed uh, direction setting for uh, the way we must look at uh, India and uh, building resilience going forward. Uh, I think these were re really powerful uh, statements from uh, both of you. Uh, I take heart on one very big space in the financing area, and that is the bond markets. In mm -hmm. India forever, uh, there have been uh, a few of us uh, helpless, hopeless voices that have been shouting from rooftops that, that we are much too dependent on a banking system, a banking system which gives a uh, very short tenured debt to long-term uh, infrastructure. And the need to develop our bond markets was critical, but this has fallen between the stools repeatedly. We've had bursts, bursts of activity under some uh, finance ministers, some governments, and then it falls away. So what we have today is actually a crying shame of a bond market. And it is really not developed at the scale that our economy should reflect. So that's the starting point. Now, the good news is because of the shambles that the banking system is in and the risk aversion therein, uh, lo and behold, the need for the bond markets, exactly as Sean set out, is back in focus. So uh, it's not necessarily happening the right way. I think pushing companies to go borrow, borrow abroad and uh, interest rates and foreign exchange covers, I mean, those risks are very uh, real, but it is at least access to capital, it's access to longer term capital, and we are therefore at least being able to bring some money in to companies and into uh, growth uh, in the country as required. So as in times like this, and you know, India always grows in fits and starts, ours is always a very sore to grow as we go forward. Uh, and we need these nadirs, you know, the, the messes and uh, the almost bankruptcies as we've seen in the past to have the next wave of growth. And I do believe that we are at that fundamental point where we would really miss a beat if we didn't uh, in the way, you know, Ratan suggested, uh, in the way maybe the Atmanirbhar discussions are going. Uh, all of this is again rethinking and I hope rethinking in a way that we remember our lessons of the old and you know, we stay clear of self-reliance, meaning bad quality, to, set, to competitiveness in a global context, which means we have the best of everything in India for our citizens, because we are indeed the best in the world for what we manufacture. So the way we rethink our economy, the way we rethink manufacturing and the way we rethink our financial markets will set the tenor for growth going forward. Now, the good news is that we are quite interconnected with the rest of the world, as we know in the stock markets. Uh, mm -hmm. The way foreign institutional investors breathe uh, changes where our stocks quote. No matter that we have a fairly robust domestic mutual fund market, we have the life insurance company, et cetera, which come in from time to time, but the foreign institutional investor does drive a lot of change. And the foreign institutional investor, uh, many of them are quite, uh, and particularly some of the European ones, in fact, a lot of the large ones now are also talking about resilience and uh, uh, let's call it green, but in a way that does count. So it's almost and often a discussion of where we will not invest. So that's a good starting point that companies have to begin to look at the way uh, you run the company. Uh, that indeed leads to the way regulations must get set and the way companies themselves adhere to it. The issue in India in terms of the strategy on sustainability and resilience taking a corporate perspective is I do believe our big guys get it because they are dependent on international pools of capital because uh, you know, they will borrow from an IFC who will put strictures in terms and sometimes very high standards, higher than what the company believes it can achieve and then lo and behold, it achieves it in terms of the debt it borrows. But 
that large bucket of MSMEs, uh, which sits in the middle, is struggles to get there. And we don't make it easy for them because the regulations exist, but the regulations are often seen at a level that they cannot achieve. And then it begins the whole process of buying your way around the system. And uh, the answer has to be, I think, of, you know, if you've got an industrial zone, provide for all the facilities, you know, water recycling, sanitation, plastic waste management, and bill for it. Because for each company to adhere to the norm as is required is really, in fact, very, very difficult. And I would say almost impossible at, at times. So the way to do this is to provide the service and make sure that there is a cost that is fully understood, recognized, subsidized if required, but provided for. So we, again, if we rethink the way our industrial zones work, it isn't just about attracting investment there, but also the infrastructure we provide, which is not just the land and road, or maybe some stops for export, but the entire sustainability infrastructure uh, in terms of uh, the delivery therein, and also then the pricing therein, so that companies that come in know what they will be paying and not change those contracts as we go. I think, uh, and I just had an article today in the Alien Express, which uh, is uh, titled uh, uh, Rethinking Our City. And uh, if you look at the COVID crisis, uh, it is very centered in our cities. It is now moving from cities into rural through passage of migrant labor and movement. But it really was our cities that uh, started it and uh, we know that where the concentration is largest, the dharavis, et cetera, is where the problems were toughest to, uh, uh, to, to resolve. So how about looking at the sustainability and resilience of our cities? And then when you begin to look at that, it all connects back with climate and green. So if you start with, I think what, what Sean highlighted, the whole pandemic waiting to happen, predicted, because the interconnects between health, changing climate, and therefore, whether it's the locusts coming in with more frequency or the health hazards, or the fact that malaria will go into countries which it didn't exist in because the mosquitoes are able to breed in areas where the climate changes and uh, they begin to spring up where they weren't before. Uh, these health hazards are enormous for us. And they, today it may be a COVID, uh, tomorrow it may be something else. But how we deal with climate and health is critical. And I was just actually on a, in a conversation with uh, Dr. Pratap Reddy yesterday of uh, Apollo Hospitals. And here's a guy who you know, could have easily been talking about, let's build more hospitals. But what was he tell telling us? He was saying what we need is more immunity in every human being. So how do we build that immunity? And we build it by having proper water, proper sanitation, uh, proper provision of public services, all of which is green and required funding. And we need to have an ecosystem by which the municipality to whom we entrust this has the ability to fund itself, so, you know, whether municipal bonds or green bonds or whatever structure, so that that provision of service can happen at a level where, on the one hand, our immune systems are built up in a way that we can resist any pandemic and any COVID crisis. And God forbid, if we hadn't had uh, SBM, the Swatpara movement, where our whole COVID struggle might have been, I suspect it would have been a lot worse if we hadn't got hygiene into the language. The hand washing was already in the language of communication at many levels, rural and urban, uh, under the whole wash agenda of SPM. And thank goodness for that. Uh, toilets were also uh, provided, have certainly helped in terms of diarrheal deaths and statistics as we see them. So the immunity systems that we build connect with two very big climate discussions. One is, uh, as I just mentioned, and the other is it connects back to pollution where again, COVID is a lung related, one of its worst impacts is through the lungs. If we have weak lungs and which many of us we must have from the pollution that we have breathed thus far, we, our immune system is broken. 
So how about giving us the clean air, the clean water and clean sanitation we need in order to be able to bust every freaky virus that comes our way. And that I think is where the starting point of COVID and green can be. The sustainability and resilience at the core of which is inclusivity so that it impacts every one of us, poor or rich in the same way and gives the helping hand to those who in fact find health care so unaffordable that they shouldn't ever need it because we give them the nutrition and health that they need uh, in the ways that uh, we can provide through a green uh, environment. And then the funding therein to follow. So bonds and at the core of it, inclusion and uh, safety and immunity, I think might be the way we bring everything to converge in uh, that appeals to a politician but also appeals to those of us in the world of green finance. Yeah. So I'll, I'll pick up the last statement and go straight at it, which appeals to politicians. Mm -hmm. So uh, Samir, you're here and you've, you have your ear to the ground. Um, um, you know, the budget uh, speech of um, uh, our finance minister this year, uh, it had the uh, murmurings of something that she said, like a green infrastructure and everything. And when it actually came to really test all of those things in terms of support measures, when the crisis really hit us, uh, we see that uh, we have uh, clearly shied away from bringing these concerns into our support measures. So um, going back to this really simple notion of why is it that sustainability and sustainable finance, which is, an, which is a means to bring the sustainability together, doesn't really capture the imagination of our political leaders and uh, the narrative and policy making? So, I, so Nia, I, before I respond to you, and I think this is a, a excellent question, especially based on what both uh, Ratin and uh, Ms. Kedwai have uh, suggested in their intervention, and of course, uh, the excellent overview that Sean gave us right at the beginning. Let me re uh, point people to a report that was uh, released in, in some sense, uh, driven and steered by Ms. Kidwai in, I think, 2016 or 17, I don't remember the exact year, uh, delivering a sustainable financial system in India. I think uh, Nick Robbins and others were involved in producing that report. I still think that remains one of the best reports on what India needs to do uh, that has never been read by anyone who needs to read it. So I think uh, this might be a good time to go back to that report where she has some practical steps. Uh, and I will refer to some of it in my response to you. And of course, let me also point to uh, uh, the paywalled columns that Ratin writes um, uh, so that he can only uh, be read by those whom he likes, uh, should also be made public and be made part of the larger uh, access, uh, 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 you know, access, access framework. And hopefully many of his musings on what India should be doing, uh, it will be adopted by others once he leaves his current position. I think sometimes uh, uh, the words are wiser in, 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 uh, once the person is no longer, uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, so should we, be should we be celebrating his exit? <laughs> uh, maybe he leaves behind, uh, uh, you know, his going will have more impact than his remaining where he was. But I think all the best you need to endeavor and I'm sure that at ODI, you will uh, be able to do something I'm going to suggest now in response to Neha's question. Neha, the answer is very simple. Uh, and it, it draws from both Ms. Kedwai's and Ratin's response. I think India has a oversized imagination of its ability to be a tech giant. And that has crowded out any conversation on any other aspect of its growth and development agenda in the recent past and perhaps it will continue in the future. We are not tech giants. We have just migrated from kindergarten where we were digital service providers to tech giants to now taking baby steps in building something of our own. We are still in kindergarten and yet we have imagined our size to be uh, comparable to uh, US tech and China tech. We are not there yet. And I think as long as we don't understand this, we will continue to prioritize wrong sectors. And I think uh, uh, that, has some, that has some reference to what Ratin has been saying for a while. Uh, second, we have oversized our ability to become the new manufacturing hub in the, of the world. 
and therefore we believe that we can take everything china uh, is going to release or others are going to move out of china that's again not going to happen it has not happened simply because there are systemic and structural issues that prevent india from being a manufacturing hub and a pandemic does not change that systemic and structural uh, reality uh, unless serious work is put into it over the next few years and then we should start talking about it so again i think because we believe that we are going to be beneficiaries of an anti china mood we perhaps may be focusing in the wrong direction rather than focusing in that one area where where we are the superpowers of the world where are we the superpowers of the world in human misery we have more human misery per square inch than any other country and this is our growth sector our simple endeavor over the next decade has to be to alleviate human misery and by doing that we will build business models we will build enterprises we will build transnational corporations which providing india's anti misery solutions to the world and i think this is the sdg agenda captured in a twitter feed or, or on a nice tweet that others can understand we can be the world's superpowers in responding to human needs like uh, ratin has outlined and like uh, ms kadwai mentioned be it sanitation healthcare air quality of air or be it even uh, low cost housing uh, habitable cities sensible uh, uh, rural economies uh, productive agriculture uh, models etc 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 so i think our largest and most viable enterprise area is this and yet it is least in our imagination in imagination it is seen as a gsr government social responsibility rather than government's largest opportunity and i think the minute we see investment in the human sectors in human capital as our single biggest growth area we will begin to see policy uh, wheels turn in the right direction so i want to uh, and therefore the murmurings or the 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 ambiguous statements in budgets and uh, and support schemes thereafter uh, are are never uh, 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 fully uh, uh, wedded to this idea of delivering human beings from $2000 to $10000 if we take that as our national enterprise the income levels of every indian our gdp is bound to grow our, this is this is economics and maths and it does not require any sensible person to be sitting in any chair so i think that's my first uh, 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 idea for you second i think india is going to shrink in its size and hopefully shrink in the right sectors i am not as confident as ratin that Uh, the sectors that were flabby are necessarily going to be the most impacted i sometimes have a sneaky feeling that the worst of our economy is going to tide through rather well and 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 that worries me no end and uh, uh, clearly some of the large the, uh, over leveraged sectors uh, are going to perhaps see the other end of this pandemic better than the uh, less catered to and more important core sectors Uh, and again i have mentioned a few of them in my opening uh, statement uh, one of them is i think uh, we have a flabby technology bubble which is far bigger than our real capabilities and i and i and i believe this is going to remain with us and going to become even bigger so the tech bubble is a reality in the next 2 to 3 years rather than a tech correction and i think that's something that i worry about similarly i believe that we have made a market case for solar without developing the institutional capacity to go solar and a solar bubble is also likely to mushroom in the same period without building the financial and infrastructure and human capability frameworks that can have sustainable solar uh, uh, solarization or renewable energy uh, 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 implementation in the days ahead so i think uh, i agree with ratin completely but i believe some crucial sectors on which we are actually pinning our hopes are likely to become more dangerously leveraged than they are today and i think that worries me now but we have two brahmastra for a very small economy and we are a very small economy 2000 dollars per capita income that's how i measure uh, our economy i don't look at any other number at 2000 dollars per capita income of which 200 dollars is going to disappear courtesy the pandemic so we are going to be 1800 dollars per capita income uh, we still have two brahmastra two very very big strategic tools we have never had more global power than at 1800 dollars per capita income why because a the world's future as a viable planet depends on my climate behavior and i think this is a very very important weapon in indian hands shawn kidney cannot enjoy beautiful london weather if indians don't behave in a certain way over the next 10 15 20 years london will be underwater as lord adele turner feared 
So we have one very big tool that the world is dependent on our climate choices today. We are the world's largest climate mitigation opportunity. In a current scenario, one third of all future emissions come out of India. And these one third emissions that we can potentially emit give us leverage. And I think this must be the proposition we bring to the table as we redesign and re-stimulate our economy going ahead. And that's going to be my third point, I'll come to that. The second two, there is no global sustainable development goals going to be achieved unless India achieves its SDG. The MDGs were dependent on China, SDGs are dependent on India. There are no development goals to be achieved if our human condition does not improve. So that is the second very important global imperative that resides with Indian policy decisions today. Now let me come to my third point. Therefore, we have to use these two strengths that India has, uh, being a very small economy as Ratan outlined, um, to do a few things. Number one, can we use this uh, uh, position of strength to tell the world and negotiate with the world to create the biggest green stimulus package for the world post the pandemic, of which naturally India will be a one third beneficiary. So can we catalyze global financial flows that will help in India's uh, stimulation of its economy, which our current banking system and government uh, revenues don't allow us to do? Uh, we can be Atman Nirbhar in everything else, but our stimulus will have to be outsourced to others because we don't have enough within our own systems to stimulate the economy in the direction that we require. So can we outsource stimulus by telling the world, I'm your largest solar power project, come and invest in me. And if you are able to get the investment and the shape of the investment and the texture of the investments right, those are details that Sean and Ratin will work out. I can re reduce emissions by one third and I can bring in trillions of dollars of, of, of global commercial capital. I'm not asking for donations and charity global commercial capital through bonds, through consoles, through um, uh, commercial banking routes and help them re-stimulate my infrastructure investments, my mobility investments, my green city in investments, my low cost housing investments, my human capital investments. So between the SDG and the climate basket, we need to build the largest stimulus proposition for the world, sell it to our local people as bringing money into the country and sell it to the world as solving their climate and development challenges. So I think this is one idea that India must embrace. And as we move to COP26 in Glasgow, like we created the French, Indian, American uh, 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 collaboration to build the Solar Alliance, can we build the most ambitious green commercial banking or green finance arrangement that India co-chairs with the institution in New Delhi, all our Babu's like institutions in our country. So can we create the world's biggest green finance bank in New Delhi? It will be symbolic. It will be a counter China signal. It will be geopolitical in nature. It will be important because our Babu's love to get jobs in international institutions. And it will be real because it will help finance the solar ambitions and other ambitions that we've been speaking about. So can we use this pandemic moment to actually put together what Ms. Kidwai mentioned in 2016 as building a sustainable financial architecture that will deliver green growth for the future. And I think this is something that I want to leave the panel. <clears throat> Thanks, Samir. I think um, very bold and very, very thought provoking ideas. And I will actually bring both Sean and uh, Ratan in this time because there is a question, uh, in fact, uh, a solution in the short term um, is that of demand that is chasing uh, yield uh, in emerging economies. So there is something that an emerging economy like India can do to tap that demand. And a lot of that demand is classified as green capital and we can bring that in. Uh, the other question on institution and this, this reimagining uh, or imagining in fact, not even reimagining uh, of this green stimulus, the largest green stimulus, and looking at an institution which actually funds the stimulus, uh, we have had some of these examples uh, earlier. We have had, you know, uh, not, not green stimulus, but we've had the idea of a BRICS bank. We've had the idea of, you know, these regional sort of banking or institutional systems. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm afraid to say that we don't hear much of that really progress in today's time. So here I'd like to bring, say, Ratin's mind on it, that would such an institution 
uh, or how you will how will you make it work what will what should be the metrics which should actually be used as a filter for such an institution to really deliver because Neha, i want to jump in i want to jump in sorry i just want to say some yes 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 <laughs> this is what we have to do an institution is one of the pieces but all yeah. the other parts absolutely right and i think we can do this and i think you're absolutely right about the leverage that india has to be able to do this this is the essence of what we need to do and we 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 we're having a little experiment now in the international solar alliance we're setting up a world solar bank and the green climate fund i think is putting a little bit of money into it but it's small we need something much more substantial to be able to do all the things that are on the table and your comments about thinking about alleviating suffering fantastic way of looking at it i think that's absolutely right if we get this right it means the sdgs it means all the other things as well so I, I just want to say that before I let Ratin dive in with his comments. Yes, yes, yes. And, and yeah, I'd like sorry, to come in. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry. Yes. I just, can I? Uh, sorry. Can I just complete that point because I think I, I left something important. I think one thing yeah. more that we need to do, which Ratin and Ms. Kidwai and others have been speaking about for long, is to this time in Glasgow ask the banks to sign the Paris Agreement as well. I think the banks have not signed on to the deal, and I just want to give you some numbers. that in uh, a 2018 review by the UNFCCC we found that only 681 billion dollars uh, uh, of global cl climate financial flows existed now uh, that's a 2016 number i can bet my bottom dollar it's still less than a trillion dollars now uh, <laughs> ms kidwai's own report talks about the large amounts needed in various parts of the world the imf uh, estimates it to be just under 10 trillion dollars for the emerging countries Uh, they talk about a hundred trillion dollars parked in patient capital in the OECD. Ms. Kidwai talks about hundreds of trillion dollars parked with various asset classes around the world. So I think the financial sector has to sign the Glasgow Agreement. Can we also make that happen so that a green financial institution is only a think tank? We have multiple activities, both commercial, yeah. bond, consoles around it. Sorry, sorry for intervening. And actually, Neha, this. this was the point i wanted to come in on uh, that yeah. I, it, this isn't about just setting up a green institute of course anything you do in that front is helpful it is about ensuring that it is embedded in every financing that all financing should have at its core resilience and uh, the ability to direct money into what is right and sustainable uh, and india has been uh, disappointing in that regard because for years while a lot of the european banks had signed up to the equator principles and equivalents uh, some of us who worked on this struggled to get one uniform uh, agreement which was an indian standard uh, and we had giz and others who finally worked on this uh, so that the indian bankers association signed up yeah. to something but it was so disappointing that it took almost 3 years to get what was a very frankly uh, uh simple document it's not even set the standard halfway to where i believe it needs to be but even to get a common platform so we need a common platform for india there is no point in having one bank say i will not finance this project because it does not meet the right resilience and sustainability standards when there are 10 others standing there ready to do it so let's start by developing this as a baseline which is set for all financing whether it's in the capital markets or the banks and that would be a good start i think the institution we need is not the institution to direct finance but the institution which trains bankers as to how to look at what is sustainable or not from the lens of risk because at the end of the day it is about risk flooding is a risk uh, health is a risk pandemic is a risk how do i price that into how i lend but we are not used to looking at the, at it from a risk lens so that's the training we need an institute that trains bankers on how to look at green and sustainability and risk and pricing therein and so it becomes again embedded in the system so, uh, and i just end by saying that what we call green in india is just renewable financing we have an inherent inability to look at green which is water efficiency or energy efficiency 
or anything that requires real application of mind in terms of it being green, but because we don't know how to apply it or measure it or rate it, or, and there were some questions from the audience on impact bonds, or even look at impact, what do we do? Because renewables are green, all money that we're doing in terms of green finance is largely going to renewables. This is lazy green banking. So we need to expand the portfolio to look a lot more different than what it looks now. But anyway, the, yeah. Ratan, it was for yeah. you to Let come Ratan in. Let come in. Uh, let Ratan come in because I will also have a couple of points to make on, on the points that you made, Naina. But Ratan, uh, please respond to Samir's big idea. I think Samir's big idea is absolutely complementary to what I've been saying. And I'm glad he enunciated it the way he did. His big idea is related to the prospects for us. I just want to join one dot here. So we essentially have a blackmailing proposition for the world. <laughs> and so what we want the world to do is acknowledge that, and that's very important. That if we think we'll take you with us. But if we are not able to demonstrate that as a consequence of getting the world to accept this argument, we, we have the means to reduce misery and make money. Exactly like he said. Exactly like he said. Because we have not done that in the past. Because of what he said about tech. Uh, <clears throat> about this, this, this mindless uh, you know, chasing of export led opportunities. Because of uh, mindless uh, focus on intermediate goods like energy without asking what it is being used for. Then the money will not come. And therefore, I think all I want to add to what, and then I want to, if, with your permission, respond to a couple of relevant questions here, add to what Dena and Samir said, is where's the product? Like Dena was saying, I can see some product in renewables, but as Samir correctly pointed out, that's a highly flawed product. Where's the product in agriculture? People talk about zero-based natural farming. That's still sitting in civil society NGO space, CSR space. There's one South Indian guy who talks about it. Neha, I think he's a friend of yours, poor chap. But it takes like years to convince uh, Niti Aayog to even take it seriously, although there's been a mention in the budget speech. Uh, there is no talk about a slum free India that addresses the key opportunity we have, which is to use public land to build the slum free India. So we will have to come up with business plans to reduce misery. At the moment, my big takeaway from Samir is. We don't have a business plan to reduce misery, and therefore we're not making money, and therefore we're not growing. If we have that business plan, then, as Sami rightly said, the resources are there. Let me just pick up a couple of questions. One is from Prashant Vaz. Prashant, the long term, um, uh, 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 that, uh, you've asked a question here, which I hope people can read. Uh, <clears throat> the stock of government debt will balloon, but it doesn't matter. Why does it matter if the stock of government debt balloons? Only if it affects the government's solvency. With the consul, it doesn't matter what happens. And the long-term value of debt taken today, which is paid in permanence, uh, you know, deteriorates over time, which is why you pay a higher rate of interest. So any banker doing the calculation will understand that. If you're going to pay back something in 28 years, and I offer you a slight you know, time reference of interest margin on that, you won't be distorting markets unduly. What you will be doing is reducing the time reference caution on long-term uh, financing, which is a good thing. A question asked on the chat website for some reason by uh, Pustak Joshi is about bond yields. And I want to say I agree with you that this is as true in the long term as in the short term. I don't understand what is wrong with financial sector people and chief economists of banks in this country with some notable exceptions. Rating agencies from now on for the next three years are going to judge your performance in, on the basis of what you did about the pandemic, and how you manage to recite in the pandemic. They're not going to judge it looking at a balance sheet. I promise you that. And the evidence is there in that question that uh, Indian debt is being exited. Indonesian, Malaysian, Korean debt is net positive because they have demonstrated successful yeah. resilience to the pandemic and also a plan of what they will do over the next three years. There was a final question in this context from Mr. Patnaik. Uh, dear me, I can't find it, but that I, I, it will be important. I, mean, I can read it for you. Hmm. No, I can see it. I can see it now. Okay. Uh, the Indian stock market. No, Mr. Patak, it's very simple. The Indian stock market has, uh, this is a very odd situation. We are in, the debt is perceived to be more risky than equity. 
and uh, safe uh, and, and, and bank deposit rates are low and likely to fall. And therefore, there are a number of people in this country who have not lost their jobs, a number of people who earn rentier income, a number of people who earn capital income, and that income needs a home. And that home, if you look at the stock markets very carefully, it's not happening in small caps or in mid caps. It's happening in different kinds of blue chips. It's happening also uh, in places like Yes Bank, where investors are seeing a pathway to sort of uh, you know temporary value addition. So it is quite logical that in a in a situation where you don't know what's going to happen in the long term, you will get money coming into Indian stock markets. It's not a it's not a reflection of a misplaced movement. It's completely consistent with the way in which uncertainty is affecting our economy today. Um, it was quite a vote for the equity markets. <laughs> <laughs> We also have a question, and maybe I want to put this to some here, um, from Nick Robbins, which is, what do you think the key milestone should be for this journey to COP26 that you've outlined? And uh, so, what does the G20 need to do? And could a big, bold, green sovereign bond or resilient sovereign bond from the Indian government help galvanise attention around this? Three questions for you, Samir, and of course the others. So, so let me let me answer uh, both uh, Nick and uh, Sarthak who have posed questions here, but in some sense related. Uh, uh, I am uh, I, so I think G20 itself is a great opportunity for India. 2022, India is going to be steering the G20. So in 2021, which is next year, we will begin the process of announcing our priorities, building our working groups, creating the teams that will move into our. The presidency is always a year delayed from the time you take action if we do want to take action. So if India is going to be acting on its G22 uh, uh, leadership at the G20, we will have to start acting out next year and work towards uh, uh, our agenda, which means that this is the time for India to put together a green finance and a, and, and a green bond or a green instruments framework uh, by which it will benefit. And of course, by which it can uh, also take and champion the cause of uh, the, the emerging countries that seek similar uh, financial flows for their own um, uh, imperatives. Uh, now, I think I am not certain whether a big, bold, green, sovereign bond is the answer. Uh, I think that could be part of that answer. But I think equally important, and again, I'm drawing into what Ratin has been writing about in the past and what uh, Ms. Kidwai has also proposed in one of her reports, is can we decentralize this to India's reality? And can we focus more on building city bonds and municipal bonds and, and and uh, uh, regional bonds, uh, which are more manageable, which are more doable, which are more answerable to the constituencies they they serve. I think one of our uh, one of the way India will be judged, and I think Ratin is absolutely spot on, is not what by the announcements of the central government. It is going to be judged by how it empowers the local governments to respond to the effect and impact of the pandemic. I think lots of us have been saying this in different ways, but India's response is going to be at the cities, is going to be in the states and how we build institutions there. How do we federalize our, our stimulus uh, arrangement is going to be the single most important. So I think, yes, a big India bond may be part of the solution, but taking some champion cities and building uh, green bonds in those champion cities could be an equally exciting prospect because it would be a marker for India deciding to use its entire geopolitical apparatus to respond to its biggest challenge in its lifetime, as Ratin was mentioning. In our lifetime as a young nation, this pandemic is our biggest hit. We have not used our full political muscle. We are still operating only out of New Delhi. And I just want I, to- I, I would like to make one point then, if I may, uh, yeah. which is to the, it, but to say that so far, the government of India has shown an amazing political churlishness and illiberality in how it has dealt with the subordinate parts of government. And I cannot simply cannot understand this insecurity in a government that ought to know perfectly well that it will win every election going forward at the center, irrespective of what happens to the economy. I don't want to elaborate any further yet. I certainly will from next month. So this illiberality in financing state governments, this unwillingness to share even a modicum of credit with state governments, then translates into state governments being illiberal with their subordinate units. So I think what Samir is saying is very important. We need to have a massive at a think tank level, rethink on this. And until that happens, I'm afraid that the solution is not going to come. You cannot have a central government that is terrified of, of, its, of its state government partners, and that is in debt to it, uh, if you are going to get these nice outcomes. I just wanted to, 
to draw uh, uh, Nick in, uh, into this uh, as, uh, and Samir, a lot of the work on that UNEP report you referred to was really, as you had uh, earlier alluded to Nick, uh, you know, been by Nick and his team. And uh, we are very fortunate to have guys like Nick uh, have India close to his heart. And we should really be drawing on some of uh, these sort of minds and skills uh, and, uh, from all of you uh, involved in climate bonds and uh, Sean. Uh, on what this new structure should look like, because actually the solutions lie in all these buckets. There is no one solution. We need every one of the suggestions that is being made, all playing together, uh, all enabling different products, different innovations. We haven't even talked about the small social impact bonds. They're small, but they play a key role in terms of the inclusive financing piece, even while we look at the large central government type of uh, issuances or indeed empowering the states as Ratan rightly suggests and uh, Samir has mentioned to draw money. So uh, I, I just really did want to say that for all of this, we should be really pulling together maybe a compendium of all of these ideas because every one of them is workable and uh, should have been executed as of yesterday. But I still would really like to see that every arm of every institution in this country, rating agencies should have green rating capabilities. Uh, uh, all finance uh, streams should have the ability to understand risk and green. So embed what is right at, about sustainability and resilience and all the themes we are discussing today in everything we do so that we can get this right. And I can tell you that from a couple of the global boards I'm on, uh, the activism they see from large shareholders, forget uh, the NGO activists, that is always an embarrassment and awkwardness at the doorstep, but from the foreign investor community that invests in them and the questions that come from there in terms of embracing what is right uh, is absolutely right on our doorstep in as far as our stock markets go. And the markets are already rewarding the companies that get this right. And equally, the markets will reward the countries that get it right. So we just have to begin to do the right thing. And where we do the right thing, communicate what we are doing effectively. Know why we're doing it and to communicate it would be equally important. So the time has come to ensure that we can move this uh, agenda forward uh, a lot stronger than we have historically. And Nina, it's Why worth saying, so, someone, someone asked um, uh, the green bonds in the international market from Indian companies. Yes, we've already seen great success, but as mm -hmm. a couple of us said, it's been very narrow. It's been focused on renewables, not on the broader agenda around uh, environment and resilience. So it should be including water infrastructure, especially. It should be including renovation of our cities, as Ratham was talking about in addressing slums in an efficient manner, energy efficient and water efficient manner. It should be including agricultural investments that lead to greater sustainability and building up that agriculture side. These can all be a simple extension of the success that Indian corporates and state-owned enterprises or have already had in international markets. And to go back to the point that you made and Samia made and Srathi made municipalities and provinces. This is an area where we haven't even touched the, the whole idea, but there is such enormous capacity to take our leaders and our champions first to the markets, to raise funding for necessary infrastructure that will boost development and growth in these areas. I mean, there's work got to be done on the business plans, as Rathin says, that's the challenge, but there's certainly an opportunity there. We, we, haven't even touched on forest, John. we haven't even touched on forests, carbon credits. And, and forests, forest. absolutely. Yeah. And, and of course, we also today haven't talked about a, a key recovery agenda, which will be jobs. So whatever we do in the next six months, we need to be also looking at job creation, the people. And one of the things that we can do is look for the link between green and recovery and jobs. Environmental restitution programs, for example, could well be funded by international parties and other countries within India to improve, the, fix up the environment and to replant forests. We already have some forest planting goals in India. Let's expand those at this particular moment as a way of soaking up unemployment quickly um, just to get, to get people moving again. 
Rafim. Let me just very quickly say, Sean, that if you do what Sameer is suggesting and I have been alluding to, which is work on making money by reducing misery, I don't have to worry about jobs. Sure. Plenty of jobs in health, <laughs> plenty of jobs in education. The, the, the problem is when you go into what he calls flabby tech, that is where you start getting the job shortage. The moment you get out of coda world, you know, there's only so many coders you can produce. The other point I want to caution when we talk about foreign finance is very important, and I, I don't know why, this, as a macroeconomist, I must say this to you. It's very important. You, I, I, I can elaborate elsewhere, there's no time. You cannot use foreign money to buy non tradables Beyond the point. Very simply put, unless you're willing to pay Indian school teachers in dollars, those dollars are useless to me if what I want to do is pay teachers with them. Because if you wanted to pay teachers with them, you'd have to convert them into rupees. Your forex reserves would go up, and you'd have rupees with which you'd pay teachers. You might as well have printed the money and paid the teachers if you're not interested in the forex reserve company. So this is called the absorption spending problem, I right? macro. So please be very conscious that we constantly have to be calculating where we will get the counterpart domestic resources to pay for the counterpart foreign resources when we wish to spend them on non tradables This is what really messed up the NDGs. And as an insight to our Indian colleagues, this is what gave India a huge fit. Because when I was in the UN and the NDGs were happening, I should say, buy HIV drugs. It's garbage in, garbage out. Buy them from India, obviously. So you buy the retrovirus from India, you sell them in Africa, nothing happens in Africa, 100% of the money is spent on imports, everyone is happy, HIV is solved. Unfortunately, education, health, and anywhere you have to spend non tradables that doesn't quite work. We'll have to work a little hard in solving that problem. And might I, I add... Just seven. Yeah. Can I just come in with two short points? The first, of course, is what the pandemic has taught us is that we don't need to be sitting in our offices to be dispensing our jobs. Uh, that has an international impact. Now just think about it, that if this is true that we can work from anywhere for the corporation or enterprise or institute that we serve, uh, Indian sitting in India can be solving Russia's problem. The whole idea of migrant labor goes away. International migrant labor could be still located in its geography of origin. Can we see education? As a, as a high growth area, not because we only want to educate every Indian, which we must, but also because educated Indians and young educated Indians could now be catering to the world, which has got used to the idea of having people work from them from distances, teach them the language courses, make them the chartered accountants of the world, make them the accountants of the world, make them the coders, make them even the basic data operators for, for, for global systems. Uh, please remember, uh, the world may have invested in factories in China, but they always send their data to India because there is trust here. We have never leveraged this as well. While they were building their big corporations, Deutsche Bank was still operating its back office in, in, in India. That tells you that they are they, the world is more comfortable with the idea of India being a service provider for them. Can we use this work from home opportunity to build a whole new architecture, maybe at a G20 itself, to create a, go, a, 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 a local global force, a workforce that, that serves different geographies as the world ages and some countries grow younger. It will be beneficial for uh, African countries as well as India. So I think education and investing big in education, as Ratin was mentioning, rather than, rather than uh, uh, spending foreign reserves on, on, on education is something that we need to start thinking about. The second and final point is that, you know, one of India's big champions during the pandemic, uh, uh, my boss, my former boss, my current boss, Mr. Mukesh Mani made a big AGM speech where everyone was excited by all his... Uh, 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 you know, uh, big ideas around technology and growth and retail. But he made the most important, for me, the most important part of his speech was when he committed that his, the world's largest energy company is going to become net emission zero in 2035. And I think no one has picked on that single line that must become the, the, the mission statement for many of us over the next decade. When the biggest energy company says, I will be net emission zero, then I think this is an opportunity. There is obviously a business case to move towards that emission, new emission zero framework. And can, can we therefore look at this message coming out of that big man's speech on, 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 on creating an agenda for the future rather than just being excited by the technology opportunities that of course uh, uh, he, he did mention as well. So I think there is also like Ms. Kidwai mentioned, uh, a, a business case and many businesses are seeing an opportunity in, 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 uh, in turning over their, op their operational parameters towards a new green future, uh, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because also there's a commercial case for it. I think, I think there, are, there is, there is uh, financial flows available and we will have to find instruments, bridges and pipes to get that flows to, 
the country we spoke about, how those pipes may be built, where those pipes could lead to, the roles of cities, the roles of provinces, the roles of the central government, etc., uh, etc. Et but I think uh, uh, in a uh, net emission zero India of the future should be our biggest selling pitch to the world as we seek their money to stimulate our economy in the coming years. And I think that's my uh, final point for today. Neha, I know we've got to wrap add... up. I know we've got to wrap yes. up, but I just want to make sure that all our listeners know this fantastic webinar is going to be available. It's being recorded. You'll be able to view it on YouTube if you search for Climate Bonds Initiative and also at climatebonds.net slash webinars. You'll be able to view this from tomorrow. So please share with your friends afterwards. Niha. Uh, yes. Can I just answer a question from Simran Global in one word? Yes. Yes, please do. Uh, well, actually, one sentence because she's asked two questions. The answer to your question is no. Our local what institutions is the have systemically. This is the last question in the panel, I think, or second last. Simran Global. Some great points yeah. of decentralization. But you think our local institutions, which have declined in capacity, they're utterly dependent on consultants to carry out core mandates, either position to do this transition. The answer is they are not. If not, how can the shift happen? You and I have to go and work for them. And the younger you are, the greater your ability to do so. There's no other answer. We have to do it. No one else is going to do it for us. So it has I, I been just, an Neha, just before you end, I just want to add one last point. I think many of us who are very passionate about this space are also at fault in that we are not able to speak in the language that everyone relates mm -hmm. to. So we have to be able to connect the dots back to the politician in terms of what he or she finds critical to the consumer. Uh, and I love to give the example of how when we started to star air conditioners for efficiency and the consumer had at a very easy uh, uh, visual of what was an energy efficient uh, AC or not, automatically began to aspire for the more efficient AC air conditioner because it was <laughs> energy efficient. So unless we give the tools, it's the same way as it was with air in Delhi, right, until, or in any of our cities, until we knew what we were breathing, uh, we, we didn't know. And when we didn't know, we didn't act. So someone has to put these tools in our hands in a way that we can use them and speak the language. We need to speak the language that people can relate to so that uh, we can build this into a movement rather than a webinar. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um... To summarize, this discussion is going to be very difficult, but I would just like to add a few points, picking up from what has been spoken. Uh, one of the main uh, things uh, that this pandemic has, of course, shown to us is that we need to create decentralized productive assets, which can actually suffer the shock, you know, so everything from the top is not really going to work if you really want to create a resilient economy. And that speaks to the point that Ratin and uh, Samir were making about federalizing the financing going forward to make that happen. So that is extremely important. Uh, we have seen uh, that there is source of finance available, that there is an opportunity to tap the international sources of financing in the bond markets, you know, green capital, uh, where actually what, Sunny, you say that, you know, net zero emission target, and also look at our companies, our thermal uh, uh, generation, uh, GenCos, who have this transition plan, you know, they can actually tap that market pretty aggressively and they will get, get uh, um, most likely they will, uh, they have done this before, and they have to really aggressively really look at this opportunity to tap it uh, to tap it more at the same time while that comes in i think uh, what all of you have alluded to is how do you unlock domestic mm -hmm. institutions domestic imagination to really make that happen for decentralized more small kind of investments that are required in the green space, and there are many, many opportunities. There are the, there are the level of uh, cities. There are the level of uh, you know in, in agriculture. So those are the things that one has to do. I would really like to um, end this with uh, something uh, taken from Samir. I mean, we have been till now talking about a business model for agriculture in order to double the farmers' incomes. 
I think we have to talk about a business model for various activities in the economy for incomes of Indians to multiply. And if that is something that as a singular message uh, politicians will take, the policy would uh, follow and the finance will definitely, definitely follow. So I think it was a great discussion and I will thank all of you for making the time. We had interesting questions. Sean has already said, find the recording on the YouTube. Uh, we will actually also like to work on a lot of these discussions. We are in fact working with a group of um, uh, market players in India, which have come together, deliberating on these, on these questions and trying to move the needle on sustainable finance forward. Thank you partners. Thank you everyone uh, for this amazing discussion. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, thank you. Thank you.